Hello and welcome to The Federal. This is your host of the program Off the Beaten Track. My name is Neelanjan Mukhopadhyay. A political tempest is sweeping India. The BJP is outraged again, so much that it did not allow parliament to function. The task of disrupting is normally left to the opposition, but the BJP now does it with alarming irregularity. Barring passing laws by voice vote, no substantial discussions have taken place. Rahul Gandhi is again the reason for the BJP's anger. This is because on a recent visit to the United Kingdom, he made several speeches. In these, he criticized the government and expressed worry over the state of affairs in India, especially the erosion of democratic practices and non-partisan functioning of parliament. The BJP charge was pointed. Rahul Gandhi's speeches sought to shame India's democracy, polity, parliament, political system, and the judiciary. But the Prime Minister too has repeatedly broken conventions and ranked domestic matters when addressing diaspora during visits abroad. Now to discuss all this, I have with me Professor Apurvanan. He is a professor at the Hindi department on the Faculty of Arts of the University of Delhi. He is also a regular columnist and a political commentator. He is known for his very frequent and very pointed interventions on day-to-day -day politics, something that we would be looking for once again today. Uh, welcome to the program, Professor Apurvanan. Uh, thank you very, very much, much for coming and joining us on a very crucial issue. Now, uh, Rahul Gandhi, in his various speeches, he's talked about a lot of issues, but he's selected his words to my mind very carefully. He has avoided, I think, you know, trying to convey that he's actually seeking foreign intervention. He has said that India faces an internal problem. It is an Indian problem and that the solution has to come from inside. Going to come from inside is the exact phrase that he actually uses. Now, to begin the conversation with you, uh, if I say that, how do you interpret his statements? You know, he went to United Kingdom on a, on a long, uh, you know, lecture series, you know, delivered several lectures at various places, which are all very important institutions. How would you, rep you know, interpret what all he said? Rahul Gandhi is the leader of the largest opposition party of India. When he visits a country uh, outside, uh, naturally and normally, People yeah. would like to know from him his own opinion about the state of affairs in his country. Uh, we must remember the, that he is an opposition leader. He is not the leader of the government. So the rules of diplomacy that normally apply to heads of the government or representatives of the government right. don't apply to leaders of opposition. Uh, must be very clear to us. Yes, they are, in a manner of speaking, representative of their country, their people, uh, but they are also opposition leaders. Uh, they are not bound by diplomatic norms to keep silent on certain things, to respond diplomatically uh, to certain queries, etc. They have to be frank, sincere, and honest about what is happening in their country because the people want to know. Hmm. And I think uh, uh, Rahul Gandhi uh, was very honest. Uh, he was very discreet also. Uh, he was very, uh, I would say, uh, measured in his uh, presentation and his responses. He was never loud. Uh, he, he put the things as they are in India. Uh, Indian democracy is suffering erosion and uh, people across countries outside India are watching it. Uh, we just cannot hide it. Uh, the way we live in, 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 in the days that we are, we cannot hide anything from anyone outside India. Uh, so it, it would have been futile if Rahul Gandhi would have evaded uh, certain queries or uh, ignored certain issues or glossed over certain realities. Uh, that he didn't do 
so uh, speaks volumes about his honesty and sincerity. Okay, so what you are basically saying is that Rahul Gandhi called a spade a spade. Now, if I ask you the BJP response to what uh, Mr. Rahul Gandhi said in uh, his various uh, lectures in United Kingdom, that let us not respond to the criticism, but instead question the locus standi of the critic. This is a very standard uh, strategy which the BJP has employed. Would you say that this is what is being done, that... Uh, once again, they are questioning that who is Rahul Gandhi to be making these questions? Uh, Rahul Gandhi is a citizen of India. Uh, that is his uh, first qualification. Uh, a, a citizen of India, a person who lives in India, is a citizen, has all the right to speak about his country or her country. So, uh, even if he was not a parliamentarian, even if he was not uh, a leader of an opposition party or a political party in India, he had all the right to talk about his country. So uh, we cannot question the local standard of Rahul Gandhi. Uh, who is Rahul Gandhi to speak? Uh, even I and you, uh, we have a right to speak about our country. So I, I don't know where from this uh, question is coming. And how can we even allow this question to be raised uh, to ask us about, uh, about our local standard? And Rahul Gandhi can be counted as one of us, one of the citizens of India. As I said, even if he were not uh, the leader of the largest opposition party in India, he is a citizen of India. And he has the right. No, what I'm also trying to ask is that would you say that we can now say that it has become a standard BJP tactic that do not answer the questions being raised, but try, try to discredit the questioner? Is this now yes. a standard BJP strategy? You're right. And uh, this is what they have been doing for last eight, nine years or even before that really legitimize the person who is, uh, who is putting the question or who is talking. So if we if, if we recall Ghali, it is Harek Baat pe kehke ho tum ki tu kya hai? Tumhi batao ki ya taza guftabu kya hai? So you're not talking about what I am talking, but you are delegitimizing me. You are discrediting me. Uh, and that that is the practice that Sonia Gandhi is, uh, is a foreigner. Rahul Gandhi is son of a foreigner, etc., etc., etc. Thus you discredit me. Why does he use the surname Gandhi and not Nehru as they said very recently? So you use so, various means to discredit me, to malign me and thereby uh, not allowing people to reach, uh, reach what my observation or what I am trying to talk. Okay. Now let's move on to one particular uh, Praise which uh, Rahul Gandhi, one, one argument actually, which he said in one of his speeches. He said India's democracy is, quote unquote, global public good. If it collapses, then again, I'm quoting him, democracy on the planet suffers a very serious, possibly fatal blow. If Indian democracy collapses, in my view, democracy on the planet suffers a very serious, possibly fatal blow. This is what he says. Again, he reiterates. So it is important for you too that you also agree that if democracy is actually taking a fatal blow in India, it is really, very really bad for it. And would you also say that there is any past instance of this being argued that if democratic values disappear from India, it is going to be terrible, not just for this country and its citizens, but for the entire world, but for the all, the entire humanity, it is going to be a very negative development. Again, uh, that old man doesn't leave us, and the man is uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, these words immediately uh, take me back to 1947, right. when Gandhi was asked by Sardar Patel to stay in Delhi for some days and try to douse uh, the communal flames. Uh, uh, we remember that in, in 1947, just after independence, Delhi was in flames. Yes, and at that time, Gandhi was in Calcutta. 
and, and Gandhi was in Calcutta, and so he had come to Delhi, and Sardar Patel welcomed him. September 1947, if memory serves me right, was so when Gandhi came nine to... September. And Sardar Patel uh, received him and asked him to stay in Delhi and douse the flames, communal flames. And Gandhi said famously that it's important that Delhi is safe because if Delhi goes, then India goes. And if India goes, then there is no hope for the world. These are, I don't know whether these are the exact words or not, but I'm paraphrasing those. Mm -hmm. Gandhi. That if India goes, then there is no hope for the world. And, and I think it's in this vein that Rahul Gandhi said that Indian democracy is a public good for the whole world. Not only for India, not only for Indian people, but for the whole world. It's like oxygen. If if uh, supply of oxygen repeats in one part of the world, you cannot say that it will only affect only that part. If glacier melts in Himalayas and mm -hmm. Himalayas are in India, you cannot say that, well, it's our problem. Glaciers are melting. So why are you worried? But the world gets worried. Because it affects the world at large, and and world talks to India, to 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 take steps not to let uh, glaciers melt, etc. So it's like uh, it's it's like this, and and therefore I think Rahul Gandhi was very right, and his words were apt when he said that Indian democracy is a public good, and uh, leave Rahul Gandhi aside. We have seen world leaders raising their concern when in one part of the world, democratic system collapses or uh, gets eroded. For example, what is happening in Pakistan? It should concern us because Pakistan is in democracy is in danger. It should concern us. Now, Pakistanis cannot tell us that it's our internal matter. Why are you concerned? For example, what, what happened in Afghanistan concerns the whole of world. Afghanistan is a small country as compared to India. But if happenings in Afghanistan are an international concern, how can what is happening in India not concern uh, other countries or other democracies? One of the major charges which the BJP has made against Rahul Gandhi is that he called for intervention. He called from intervention from other countries. He actually beseeched them that come and intervene into internal democratic processes within India. How do you respond to this particular accusation? Do you think that he asked them to intervene or he merely used the occasion to draw the attention of the global community on what he felt was happening within the country? And Rahul Gandhi said what we have been saying for a very, very long time, that India is not only we a meaning, We meaning a certain uh, people, section within the intelligence here. People like us, uh, who, who are again uh, uh, known as members of intelligence I, I, But there are others as well who are not treated as members of intelligence here. But we, we have been telling the world that don't treat us only as a market, don't, don't treat us only as, uh, as an instrument to be used in your geopolitical scheme of things to contain China, for, uh, for example. Uh, we are a living people. We are a living society. And it does matter if democratic, uh, democratic way of living in India disappears. We will remain buyers, we will remain sellers, we will still remain a country. Uh, we will have our army. Uh, you can sell your arms to us and we will buy arms uh, from you. But this is not what India is. India is the people of India. Uh, that, that is what Rahul Gandhi was trying to, uh, trying to say or emphasize. And I think he was very right. He was not asking for external intervention. He was very emphatic. Uh, and very clear, he said that this is our internal problem and answer will come from within, not outside. 
and he is not a fool to expect ex external intervention. Uh, he, he knows geopolitics of the day. He is not a fool. So uh, to say that Rahul Gandhi demanded uh, Europe or the United Kingdom or the USA to intervene and mm. uh, and bring a regime change is is absolutely I I would say bizarre. It's actually you know worse than uh, you know just routine political rhetoric. You know another part which I uh, which he said you know uh, referring to another statement of his which I want to draw your attention which he said at the Cambridge University, he said that the institutional framework which is required for a democracy, parliament, free press, the judiciary, they are all getting constrained. So we are facing an attack on the basic structure of democracy. Now the basic structure is coming back into our political discourse once again. I will get into the basic structure as far as the constitution and the Keshavananda Bharti case and the attack by the law minister and the vice president of India at a later point in the conversation. But what Rahul Gandhi is saying is that uh, there is a certain amount of constrainment of these elements that he's talking about, parliament, free press and the judiciary. What is your uh, assessment of this? Would you agree with this statement completely? What the government is trying to tell us is that the democracy is thriving because elections are taking place. People are voting and governments are being formed. Right. Uh, and, 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 and therefore, uh, there should be no concern about the health of democracy. Can I just but, add one more point to this? That the BJP also says that democracy is thriving in this country and the constitution is sacrosanct because... The Prime Minister says that there is only one holy text in the country and that is the constitution and that parliament is actually the temple of democracy. So how do you think that will be, you know, trample over the temple of democracy? Temple, after all, is the center point of the BJP's politics. Yeah. So uh, we still remember that uh, photograph of the Prime Minister when, when he's uh, going his head. Uh, right, in 2014. Parliament and in his second stint uh, in 2019, he is touching uh, a copy of the constitution with his head. So uh, we cannot forget those pictures. But we know very well that Nathuram Gorse, in fact, folded his hands before Gandhi before killing him. So that should also be remembered that you can, uh, can fold your hands in reverence and then shoot from the revolver that is hidden in those folded hands. So that is what is happening to Indian democracy and Indian constitution. And, and we are observing that. And Rahul Gandhi is right because democracy is not only about elections. Democracy is a deliberative process. And democracy is, uh, is, 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 is a system which ensures that the minority voice gets represented adequately and it is allowed to take part in the deliberative process. Now, which are the institutions which ensure the functioning of this deliberative process? It's parliament. Parliament, through its uh, various processes, its various uh, committees, select committees, uh, standing committees, etc. What has happened to this process in last seven, eight years uh, is, is, uh, is before us. It has been right. subverted. Uh, now a new, we have entered a new phase. In this new phase, uh, those who are, uh, who are supposed, who are mandated to conduct the business of parliament or houses. The presiding officer. Demanding. Yeah, presiding officers. Now they are demanding from the opposition leaders that they first present proof and satisfy those presiding officers for the observations that they are going to make against the government. Now, it will virtually stall the parliament, stall any discussion. No opposition leader would be able to say anything. And, and as we said, that as we saw Rahul Gandhi's speech, large portions of it, and the uh, 
effective portions of Rahul Gandhi's speech in, in the last parliamentary session were expunged. Right. It was absurd. It was farcical. But this is what uh, uh, the speaker did. And uh, this is what uh, the vice president who uh, who is presiding officer of Rajya Sabha did when he didn't allow people to speak and when we lectured them. And now the vice president has reached a state where he publicly is exhorting people to rise against opposition leaders and to teach them a lesson. This is what he did in his uh, in his speech in a few days back. In, in, in a, this was a speech you are referring to, which he made at the Chaudhary Charan Singh University in Meerut, you know, which ironically was about Ayurvedic healing. You know, so instead of healing, he was actually uh, possibly it, the argument can be that he was actually trying to you know, create more uh, wounds by actually virtually giving a call to vigilante groups to uh, to, to set uh, all leaders who go and criticize the party and the government outside the uh, outside India to be put on the uh, right track. So Rahul Gandhi is right. So first is parliament. Second is judiciary. But we have seen how uh, uncertain justice has become. Now it depends on which bench you are facing. Right. And if justice becomes so uncertain and so dependent on specific judges, then our life also becomes very uncertain. The life of democracy becomes very uncertain. And third, of course, is media. Now, media is proactively, the big, big media of India is proactively campaigning against Muslims, Christians, and opposition parties. It is very evident. It's, it's very clear. It's before our eyes. So Rahul Gandhi is concerned uh, that democracy in India is not about to collapse. It has already collapsed. Yes. That, that, is, that actually brings me to, you have actually come to the next point that I wanted to move on to from here, that it is not in the process of collapsing. The process has already happened. He, in fact, you know, says, you know, let me again quote, quote Rahul Gandhi. He asked them that how would you react if democracy suddenly disappeared in Europe? You would be shocked and you would say something like, oh my God, this is a massive blow to democracy. Well, how would you react if a structure three and a half times Europe suddenly went non-democratic? That is already happening here. That's not something that is going to happen in future. It has already happened. Would you elaborate? You already said, you know, that it has already indicated that you agree with this statement. But can you say that how it has already happened, that democracy has virtually collapsed in India? When we use the term democracy, we actually mean uh, a constitutional way of life. Right. So we abide by the constitution and we expect our governments to abide by the constitution. But we have seen uh, our government subverting constitution again and again. For example, this bulldozer justice. Right. Bulldozer justice has become a norm in Assam, in Gujarat, in Uttar Pradesh, in, uh, in Madhya Pradesh, everywhere. Now, if a crime, so-called crime has taken place, immediately a person is named as accused and a bulldozer demolishes his or her house. Now, this has become a norm. Is this constitutional? is the way justice uh, is done. Uh, but this is what is being done. Now we have a law, we have a law which was passed in 1991, which says that status quo has to be maintained so far as the status of religious structures is concerned. So- what, The Places what is of happening? Worship Act you are referring to? I'm referring to the Places of Worship Act. Right. So you have to maintain the status quo as they were in, 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 uh, in, in the state in 1947. But what right. is happen happening? Four after four, they are opening, uh, for example, now Mathura Masjid has been uh, made disputed. Gyan Wapi has been made disputed. Now, other cases are- Ushala in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, one, and, one, one mosque out in the outskirts of Mangalore, if I'm correct. So anything, any law, now laws are not sacrosanct, constitution is not sacrosanct, 
It's the will of the ruler. It's the will of the ruling party. No, in the name of uh, saving cows, what is happening across India? You have given license to vigilante groups to attack Muslims in, in, in the name of saving cows. It, it is quasi-legal because as we know that people who, who, who are responsible or the police thinks are responsible for, for the murder of Junaid and Nasir, right. of, uh, they were part of the cow protection task force of Haryana. You're, so yeah, you're referring to this recent incident in Haryana and Rajasthan where the Rajasthan police was disallowed by the people from Haryana who are part of the government process, you know, committees from interrogating people against whom there were accusations. You are referring to that case? Yes. So what I'm trying to say is that though accused persons are part of this state apparatus. Now, where have we reached? If Rajasthan is Rajasthan police is trying to arrest or detain the accused person who live in Haryana, the Haryana police, Haryana police doesn't allow Rajasthan police to do that. Similarly, we saw Uttar Pradesh police making it impossible for Rajasthan police to arrest a, a media person who was again named in an FIR by Rajasthan. Okay, Sam police went to Gujarat and arrested uh, Jignesh. Uh, Mewani uh, two years ago? Jigne not only Jignesh Mewani, an arrest was made in Delhi. Yeah, uh, exactly. So, uh, Pawan Kheda was arrested. So Very uh, recently, so yes. It was the most Very bizarre thing when Pawan Kheda was uh, deported from his plane and arrested, detained and arrested. So, all constitutional norms have broken down. It's a total breakdown. Uh, uh, and and it, it's will of the ruler, will of the ruling party, which is now operating uh, or, or running the country. No, let me let me ask you a practical question. Quite often it is argued that what Rahul Gandhi has said is correct. But then raising these issues is counterproductive because electorally this is going to antagonize the majority community. How do you respond to this kind of an argument that Rahul Gandhi is fine what he's saying, but he should not say, and especially not when he's in London? See, uh, if we take this method of argumentation, uh, then there are other arguments. Out there. For example, people say that, yes, we know that lynching of Muslims is wrong, but Rahul Gandhi should not talk about it because it would anger Hindus right. and alienate Hindu voters from Congress. So Rahul Gandhi should not speak about the killing of Ekla or he should not speak about the killing of Junaid and Nasir and he should not sympathize with Junaid and Nasir because it will anger and alienate Hindus from the Congress party. Unfortunately, uh, many people in the Congress party itself believe in, 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 in this theory uh, that uh, you should not raise this uncomfortable question because Hindus are touchy. So that is and what is called soft Hindutva, would you say? I don't know whether it's called soft Hindutva, it's not, but it's all, it's in a way uh, pandering to the Hindutva sentiments, not Hindu sentiment. Because Hindutva sentiment is essentially an anti-Muslim, anti-Christian sentiment. It's not, it has nothing to do with religion. And, and Hindutva and, sentiment, you completely differentiate with Hindu sentiments, which is to, to yes. your mind, completely different. Hin Hindutva is nothing if not anti-Muslim, anti-Christian. So you have to have violent uh, feelings or you have to have some animosity uh, towards Muslims and Christians to be a Hindutva fellow or Hindutva party. Uh, it, 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 it's not necessary that you believe in Hindu Hinduism or not. It, it's not at all necessary. Uh, so this is what Rahul Gandhi has been advised for last, last eight years. That, well, you committed blunder when you visited Ekla, who was right. murdered uh, by a mob. Uh, you committed blunder when you went to JNU to sympathize with students who were attacked by the Bharati Janta Party and uh, uh, whose representatives were arrested uh, 
uh, by the Delhi police. So Rahul Gandhi was attacked again and again for sympathizing with the persecuted people. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, that is the argument that is being made now, that he should not have spoken about, uh, about all this in United Kingdom because it would alienate Hindus. Now, if Hindus uh, are voting for Bharti Janta Party for these reasons, they are not going to uh, come closer to Rahul Gandhi if he, he keeps mum. Okay. If he keeps silent on these issues. So I think it's a non-starter. It, it takes you nowhere. It drops so, Rahul Gandhi his moral authority. Of so are you... So are you of the opinion that between now and the next 12 months, you know, in fact, within 13 months, we're possibly in the middle of a very fiercely fought a parliamentary election once again, that between this these 12 months, it's for the Congress party and the other opposition parties to try to consolidate as much of the non-BJP vote is there by taking a very strong ideological position against the BJP line, which is what all those issues that Rahul Gandhi raked up while on his visit in the United Kingdom. Is it the political part of the manifesto of the Congress party? Would you want it that way? Yes, absolutely. I think it's the duty of the Congress party and all opposition parties to tell very clearly the electorate and uh, they keep saying that 60% of the electorate is not yet with Bharti Janata Party. Yes, that's that's if, what I was indicating at. Uh, so if the if 60% of the electorate is not with the Bharti Janata Party, then it is this uh, base which needs to be consolidated, which needs to be galvanized, which needs to be taken to boots. That is the duty of the political party and not try to uh, get those Hindu Hindu or Hindutva votes, which are already with the Bharti Janata Party. And I would again like to uh, remind you of how the Democrats worked after their defeat uh, uh, in 2016. Right. It was a huge defeat. And Donald and was, Trump was the American president. Are you indicating at that? Uh, yeah, Donald Trump uh, had become the president and it, and it was very shocking uh, uh, for the Democrats. But they started consolidating their base. They went to their voters. They didn't try to wean away uh, the white supremacist voters from the Republican Party. They tried to consolidate blacks. They tried to consolidate Asians. They tried to consolidate Hispanics, etc. And they worked very hard for four years. And this is what I think is the duty of all opposition parties, including the Congress Party, to right. consolidate this base and to be very sincere and honest and not diffident before this space. Uh, they, they, they have to come across as honest people and not strategic people. So let, let me ask you a last question, you know, a slightly on a lighter note, though, this is actually not a very light thing. It may sound a bit sarcastic coming from me. So do you think that this is the end of the time when Rahul Gandhi could say that I am a Shiv Bhakt and then some other leader citing his Gotra and actually saying that he too is a Hindu? You know, that, that line of argument, that soft peddling of the BJP politics has to be abandoned and that the Congress, if it wants to actually lead the opposition, bring the other parties together, then the only way is to take a very firm action against the BJP in the run-up to the parliament elections next year. Yeah, I think uh, any gesture which is trying to caress Hindu feelings uh, is futile. Rahul Gandhi said that he wants to uh, he wants to practice a language uh, or, or or a politics of love, and he also mm -hmm. said that this politics of love cannot be practiced if you do not have courage. So right. this courage is, the courage is not to succumb to the temptations of this majoritarian language. Right. And it's in many forms. It, it, you can say that, well, I'm, I'm trying to portray, present myself as a Shiva Bhakt. Now, as a politician, 
it's it's not my business or it, to to tell my electorate that I'm Shiva. I have to tell you that this is how I want this country to run. This is this is my political platform. This is my uh, this is my program. These and, are the constitutional want, principles I believe in. Uh, yeah, these are the constitutional principles I want to follow. And it's not my Shiva Bhakti or Vishnu Bhakti or any Bhakti uh, which is being tested. Uh, so I, I think that so, courage needs to be demonstrated. So I, I think what, what you are saying and, you know, uh, you know, I'll try to sum it up on this, that the Congress needs to find courage in its convictions, in its deep-rooted convictions of the party, in the ideological roots of the movement of the, the national movement, you know, what actually led to the largest, uh, uh, you know, anti-colonial movement in the, in the world. So uh, I think you have uh, tried to explain not just what Rahul Gandhi has said in uh, while on his visit in, in the United Kingdom, but also the political controversy which has come and indicated what kind of a path you would want the Congress to adopt over the next one year at least. There's still lots to be done and talk, spoken about in the coming months and in weeks, especially about opposition unity, but we keep that for a later date and maybe come back with you on the entire issue of larger opposition. Thank you very much, Professor Apurvanan, for coming and sharing your views on a very important subject in India. Thank you very much. Subscribe to the Federal's YouTube page for more interesting updates.